Hello and welcome back. My name is Dr. Christopher Gennari, and this is Great Big History Podcast. In this episode, we talk about liberalism in the 1920s, that due to the First World War, due to the trauma and the collapse of the conservative traditional system of the 19th century, liberalism comes into its own. It's on the move. So why? Why does liberalism become really the most potent force in European, American, and world culture? Well, the world sucks. 20 million people died in the First World War. 20 million people die in the plague, in the Spanish flu. Things don't work. If things worked the way they were supposed to, 40 million people wouldn't be dead. Entire countries wouldn't be ravaged. Another 20, 30, 40, 50 million men wouldn't be damaged both psychologically and physically from the war. And so the idea was we need change. It's very simple. We need change. And liberalism is change. Remember our definition. Liberalism thinks things are bad and they need to change as soon as possible. Conservatism thinks things are fine. And if they do need to change, they should change slowly. That's Edmund Burke from the English parliamentarian from the French Revolution. That's basic tenet of conservatism is things are fine. We're not against change, but we think it should be slow because change brings, we don't know what change brings. Well, liberalism says things are so bad, we need to change them now. And if some of the changes don't work, well, that's okay because things are bad now. Now, we're going to have to talk about revanchism. R-E-V-A-N-C-H-I-S-M. It's off the top of my head. I hope it's right, but it's revanchism. That is an extreme form of conservatism, and it comes into its own in the 20s, but especially the 30s. The Nazis, the fascists, are revanchists. And that is very much, for you who are an American, Republican Party today. While there are some, especially senators, and probably some House members who I don't know about, but the Senate, you see it, are traditional conservatives. You know, in, in the American post-1950, post-1965 way. You know, they don't want a lot of change but they're open to some things. You know, the child tax credit, for example, or um, more um, hold on, I know this stuff. More, not a UBI, but um, you know, more money to poor folk, but especially working class folk who have lost their jobs that have gone to China. So more retraining, um, more subsidies to help them uh, deal with the loss of the value of their homes. So a lot of of tax credits, right? Lower taxes, Um, lower taxes, more freedom. You know, more liberty. The The idea being that you people should be able to decide what to do. So um, charter schools is, is a conservative change. Whereas liberals would say, no, improve public education. The conservative change is privatize education. Make, make all schools private, but allow public money to go towards these private enterprises. That if you allow a school to make money, make a profit, it would be better at its shop. We can disagree about that. We could discuss it. I don't agree with it, but that's a different story. But that is a conservative notion that the private enterprise, that capitalism for all its problems does more good than it does bad. That's conservative, right? We've had 
had capitalism for uh, 300 years or so. Um, and so it's not perfect. It needs some reigning in it. It needs some regulations, but it's, it's, you know, fine tuning, but it's fine the way it is. While you get liberals who say capitalism is terrible, you know, it's, it hurts a lot of people. It keeps people in poverty. This is the Bernie Sanders and, uh, uh, Miss Cortez, uh, Alexandria Cortez, um, argument. This is the socialist argument. This is the European argument that it hurts more people than it's helping. That you get huge income inequality and that hurts your society. This is the, the 99% argument. That capitalism helps the 1%, but it hurts the 99%. Revanchism. Revanchism is I want to go back. I want to return. That there was a glorious time in the past that I want to go back to. And so that's a lot of the Republican Party today. So if you make the argument that um, the Bernie Sanders wing is so liberal, it wants to break what works in America in order to make something new, you can make that argument. But the revanchist part, the very far right part of the Republican Party wants to get rid of many of the changes that have happened. The biggest one is Roe versus Wade, uh, abortion rights for women. They want to at least curtail it down, you know, the the way the way um, Grover Norquist des described government. You make it so small that you can drown it in a bathtub. You make it so hard to do that people can't do it. So you say, yes, you can have an abortion, but you have to get it in the first week. Well, nobody knows they're pregnant in the first week. You know, it's that kind of thing. Um, they want to uh, highly invest in manufacturing. Even though, even in the 1920s that we're talking about, the economy was mostly service jobs. But why, why all this emphasis on manufacturing? Because those are mostly white men's jobs. They're men's jobs. A lot of black and Latino men work in that as well. Where a service industry, whether it's retail or childcare or healthcare, is, is women's jobs, lower paid women's jobs. Um, it's it's make America great again. And you're like, well, when was America great? What what time do you want to go to? Is it the fifties, which is certainly what Reagan wanted to do? Is it the eighties? which is my argument for what, what President Trump would want to do. President Trump did very well in the 80s, did bad in the 90s, did very well in the 80s. And so he, I'd, I'd make the argument he, he'd want to go back there when he was, you know, this major builder in New York on the cover of uh, the Post and the Daily News. But there is a, a glorification in revanchism of a past and that's going to be very important in here because this is where we start really this pull that we see today that you're living through now whereas liberalism is trying to run as fast as possible and conservatism is trying to hold it back right holding it by its belt you know feet dug in being pulled you know kicking and screaming but the revanchists have a rope tied around the conservative's waist and are heave-hoeing backwards, wanting to go back to a time when men were men and women were home and black folk knew to stay quiet and just work and there weren't so many immigrants and they want to go back to a different America, an 1890s America, a 1920s America, a 1950s America. That seems to be the boomers want to go back to their, the time of their childhood. So I know I'm taking a long time on this. But it's important 
till you understand these three parts. And I know it's not on the screen. I know this is all, all dialogue. Um, but it's, it's important that you understand these prevailing moves. There's liberalism slash progressivism. And there's gradients. It's not everyone's on the far left trying to change everything, right? And then you move towards your center right, your center left, and then your center right. And then, and I'd argue Joe Biden and Hillary Clinton are center right. Joe Manchin certainly center right, which means they are more conservative. They don't want to change that much. They think things are kind of good the way they are. There, there need to be some changes. Sure, Joe Biden wants to put an African American woman on the Supreme Court. That's a change. That's liberal, right? It's not going back to a old school white dude, right? Which would be conservative to revanchist, depending on how you look at it and who it is. But the idea is this is the moment the post World War One gives birth to our partisanship, our pull between the liberals and the conservatives. Now, at this point, it's not Republicans versus Democrats. We'll talk about that as it comes apart during part three. But at the, at the moment, you have conservative Democrats and you have liberal Democrats and you have conservative Republicans and you have liberal Republicans. And we'll talk about in the 1920s, they begin to pull each other apart. These parties go into conflict as one group starts to win. And that's going to be the conflict of the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, and the 50s. And it's not till the mid-60s after the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act in 64 and 65 that you get a full break, that the Democratic Party becomes the Liberal Party and the Republican Party becomes the conservative revanchist party. But that process starts here. Okay, so let's get back to our, our slide. Liberalism is on the move in the 1920s. The world sucks. Things don't work. We need to change them now. It was born out of this desire of survival. We survived. We survived. We have to make it worth it. 50 million people are dead or hurt. We have to change. We can't, we can't do this again. That's crazy. Second is black culture was literally on the move. It leaves the Jim Crow South. Why? Because World War I required massive amounts of manufacturing of weapons, which requires massive amounts of labor. Those factories were in the North and the West. They weren't in the South. The South was still rural. And so Northern industrial cities, Northern companies, Northern manufacturers needed labor. And especially after 1917, when American white men were being drafted into the army and American black men did go into the First World War as well and served honorably, won many awards, many medals, fascinated the French and the Germans. This kind of, there's books about this, about how exotic the French and the Germans took the, um, the African-Americans because um, they're not African, right? They're American, but they're black American. And so the culture for, for, for Germans and French who had empires in Africa, it, it's this, dissidents it's like wait 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 wait. how can you be an american and be black our our africans are not german our africans are really not french the french made an argument that they would become french but eh, not really um so what happens is african americans leave the jim crow south they're pulled north buy jobs and then once those families get jobs they pull once the men get jobs they pull in the rest of their family then they pull in their cousin and so they move. And so we see this from 1910 to 1930. It drops from 90% of African-Americans lived in the South 
to something like 77% or so, 79, 77. That's millions of people moving north. And they're moving to New York. They're moving to Chicago, St. Louis, and then Chicago. They're fanning out. They're going out west. Now, there were African-Americans out west because half the cowboys, which is kind of a forgotten thing in movies and the such, but half the cowboys are African-American. And there are, there's the Buffalo Soldiers. You might see, especially if you travel down south um, on the highways, you'll see the Buffalo Soldier um, motorcycle groups, motorcycle clubs driving on I-95 on their way to Disney and the such. And it's all African-Americans. I mean, there may be white and Latino members, but uh, I've run into them many a time. And it's all African-American guys, very nice guys, you know, say hi, you know, that kind of thing at the rest stops and all that. You know, got awesome bikes. So um, shout out to uh, to them. But half of cowboys were African-American. They went west to escape the prejudice, the violence, the the oppression of the Jim Crow South, the segregation. So black culture migrated to with this new technology, radio and records and films and and photography allowed for the distribution of art that featured African Americans, that featured black culture, that represented black culture. And so you get these um, you get what we call the jazz age. We get the spread of the blues. The most famous uh, literary part is the Harlem Renaissance. Now, the Harlem Renaissance is important because of that Renaissance part. New York, being the largest city in North America, was a natural place for African Americans to go to work for free free black people to go to work. There's lots of jobs. There were neighborhoods they could live in. You know, they competed with immigrant, especially Irish labor until 1863. In 1863, right, right before the Battle of Gettysburg, there's the new draft notice that all men between this age and this age, unless they had something like $300 were going to be drafted. And New York, which was kind of the most democratic pro-Southern city in the North. It's funny because New York is also the pro most pro loyalist during the revolution. And it's kind of the most pro Southern. It's not that New Yorkers didn't fight in the, in the Civil War, of course they did. The fighting 69th, for example, an Irish, an Irish regiment. You know, but, um, but it was tied economically more than any other city to the cotton trade. And so with that draft notice, there's a riot, an economic riot that turns into a violent racist riot where the the rioters against the draft take out their anger on the African American citizens, men, women, children. And for three days it is rioting, destruction, looting, and murder. The result of this is that the black population of New York essentially leaves. It essentially, it's no longer safe. They essentially leave. One of the places they go is Philadelphia. Philadelphia becomes kind of the blackest northern city other than Chicago in the east. You know, Chicago's in the Midwest. But in the east, they, they move to Philadelphia. They go down the river. They come down the turnpike, even though it's not really a turnpike. And they come to Philadelphia. And so Philadelphia becomes, percentage-wise, kind of the blackest northern city north of, uh, northeastern city north of Washington, north of D.C., which is a southern city. The 
the Harlem Renaissance is the rebirth of black culture in New York. Now, black historians and New York historians will tell me this, there still is, between 1863 and 1920, there still is plenty of black culture, and they're totally right. Totally right. I don't know enough about it. I'm a, I'm a European military historian. But the Renaissance part is why you get the Renaissance. You go, what is it the Renaissance of? And it's black culture in New York. That black folk can be accepted, can make money, can live, can thrive in New York. And white kids embrace this black culture all throughout the country. Young white kids who were born during the First World War and start to come of age or were too young for the First World War and hit their 20s in the 1920s, they embrace black culture. And I know this because I'm a Gen Xer and my generation did the same thing with rap. Rap starts as an African-American street music dance in New York. And by 85, you've got Run DMC playing with Aerosmith. You've got the Beastie Boys doing You Have to Fight for Your Right to Party. you got Will Smith doing Parents Just Don't Understand, all of which is sucked up by white kids. Then you got the, the NWA and gangster rap of the 90s. Again, sucked up, just bought by white kids. So it was a scene as a rebellion. It was exotic. It was different. It wasn't what mom and dad did. And it was, and mom and dad were, weren't going to like it. See, this is the funny thing about jazz. Jazz is always more popular in Europe than it is in America. It was always more accepted in Europe than it was in America. And jazz is a northern, elitist, white... Um, consumed product you want to go to a jazz club you you're not a poor person but what this give what this gave was for the first time black cultural creators could have financial independence musicians actors you know they go on the stage vaudeville uh in again in new york in chicago in St. Louis, that black cultural creators could finally have fiscal independence. That for 300 years, 400 years, black folk have been making culture and making no money off of it. None. Not their food, not their music, not their church, not their art. None of it. Now they could. You're going to get black preachers in the North who are going to make not mega churches, but large churches with large followings. You know, the mega church is a modern kind of distribution concept. But you're going to get, you know, large churches with lots of people. And they're going to bring in preachers, touring preachers. They're going to bring in touring musicians. You're going to get uh, the Apollo, for example. You're going to get black theater. That's going to play to black audiences, black middle class audiences, working class audiences. And so black cultural creators, musicians and artists and photographers become fiscally independent for the first time. We get Louis Armstrong and Ella Fitzgerald. They're the first rich black celebrities. They're rich. They're not working class. They're not poor. They are rich black folk. And they made their money by singing, by making music, by using the new technologies of distribution of culture. What comes with them is the problems. Wherever black folk go, racism follows them. So racism comes with them to the North as well. Now, racism existed in the North Let's not say it doesn't it exist in the West, right? The Ch Chinese Exclusion Act kicked out um, Chinese immigrants in the 19th century. 
But what comes north is not the racism, because the racism existed. What comes north is the organized Jim Crow terrorist groups like the KKK, like lynching. The KKK, become, its most popular moment is in the 1920s. It's more popular in the 1920s than the 1870s. And it's biggest in Indiana, a northern state that fought for Union in the Civil War. And so where African Americans are now going to compete for jobs, who are they competing with? Well, they're competing with immigrants, not so much the Irish anymore, but in the start, the Irish, but then the Italians, Jews, right? Slavs, like Russians. They're competing at the lowest end of the totem pole. So they have this competition with new immigrants. So they end up with constant economic exploitation because of an owner, remembering capitalism, we talked about Marx, and Marx's problem was that the owner makes the money. The owner decides the wages. So the owner goes to the immigrants and says, I'll pay you a dollar an hour. And they say, great. And then he turns to African-Americans who have moved to New York and he says, I'll pay you 85 cents. And they say, okay, I'll take it. I need the money. So then he turns to the immigrants and goes, look, the African-Americans are taking 85 cents. I'll pay you 75 cents. And they're like, but that, you, we agreed at a dollar. It's like, well, tough. I could pay them 85 cents. Or I'll take it. And so there's constant economic exploitation of poverty. And this leads to urban poverty. So more poverty leads to more poverty because you don't have the ability to negotiate higher wages. So now we get urban poverty. And that is a new experience, experience for African Americans. In the South, they had rural poverty. And sure, they would live in towns, and those towns might be poor, or they lived in sections of towns. But now, the when I grew up in the 1980s, everyone talked about inner city poverty. When they said inner city, and President Trump said, this too, because he's a man of the 80s. When you say inner city, you mean black folk. Now, if you go to the inner city, you go to Manhattan between 15th Street and 96th Street. Like, there's a whole lot of white people in that area. That's, I mean, what part of the inner city is in, in, in Manhattan is the richest part? It's Midtown. It's the park. You know, but the idea of the inner city was it's poor black folk. And that was a very 80s definition. But th that definition starts here. That poor immigrants and poor black folk were living in cities in competition, being exploited. Langston Hughes, the writer, the poet, ties racism to the destruction of hopes and dreams. He has the poem, Harlem. What happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun or fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat or crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load or does it explode? And here, in this poem, we have the two sides. The two effects. The idea of, does it dry up like a raisin in the sun? Does it sag like a heavy load? Does, does racism and the constant strain of racism and the constant rejection caused by racism just make some people give up? Fine. Fine, I'm not going to try. I'm not going to strive. I'm not going to be. I'm not going to do. You know, the traditional racist argument against African Americans are they're lazy. Well, if you don't give them a job, 
This is the kind of argument in Langston Hughes. Well, if they don't have a job, they don't have a dream, they don't have the ability to move up, they don't have the ability to succeed, then why are they going to try? Why waste the, why waste the energy? There is a, um, I don't know its name, it might be one day in the life of uh, Ivan Il- Ililich, but it's a um, Russian story about the gulags about the gulags and it's it describes in one of the scenes it describes this man being told to fill a bucket with whatever it is you know dirt fill these buckets and he works hard and he works hard and he works hard and he gets up to the number and then the manager comes over and goes, you didn't do enough. It's like, but I did what I was told to do. And it's like, but you didn't go over it. You didn't hit the number. You didn't hit the number we wanted you to. And so they're going to take him out to shoot him. And he says, his last, his thoughts are, I wish I hadn't worked at all. I wish I would saved that energy. I'd spent so much energy and it was wasted. I should have kept it for myself. That's what Langston Hughes is talking about 20 years earlier. Or there's a second side of that, and that's Black Lives Matter. Does it explode? Does it come out in anger? Does it fester and then run? Unable to be contained. That's Black Lives Matter. That's a civil rights protest, especially um, like the Black Panthers in the 70s. Does it demand to be heard? Does it reject the oppression? The two sides is what Langston Hughes is talking about. He's also got this, another poem, Dreams. Hold fast to dreams. For if dreams die, life is a broken winged bird that cannot fly. Hold fast to dreams. For when dreams go, life is a barren field frozen with snow. So here he's talking about dreams. But dreams affected by racism. Dreams thwarted, deferred, as he writes, by racism. That the promise of the North, that the North was freedom, that it wasn't this violence, might have been true, but it was racism all the same. This is, Martin Luther King will talk about this as well, that, that, the 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 problems of Jim Crow were actually easier to solve because they were in the law. The problem of racism in the North was going to be much harder to deal with. W.E.B. Du Bois, who's going to be one of the founders of the NAACP. Racism means black Americans, quote, are always looking at oneself through the eyes of the oppressor. This is what he calls the double consciousness in his book, The Souls of Black Folk. It's the idea that one is black and then a man, a woman, or an American. One's definition of oneself is defined by others, and those others hate you. So you, you kind of see this. You see this all over the place. I mean, um, you know, whether it's telling African-American sports athletes to shut up and dribble. Just do your job. We don't want to hear what you have to say about politics. Well, why? Why not? Um. It's the idea that one is always conscious that other people see you as a black man or a black woman. 
rather than a man and a woman or an American. So when self becomes defined as an other, that you are not the majority, that you are not the typical or accepted part of the society. And so everything you do becomes affected by that. And, um, if you, if you listen to like, um, Chris Rock or Dave Chappelle, the, these jokes, um, when they talk about race, especially when they talk about the differences between young men, young black men and, and older black men and how they deal with race, you, you see this double consciousness. You see this, they're not going to say, oh, I'm quoting the boys here. It's, but they're talking about it. This idea of the double consciousness is going to be picked up by feminism and especially by the LGBTQ movements in the 90s. Third wave feminism and then the um, gay liberation movements, gay, bi, and trans, and queer movements in the 90s. That the, the idea was, I'm gay, you see me as gay rather than see me as a man rather than seeing me as a person. This is very important in the AIDS epidemic. The most important thing that happened to AIDS, um, that happened to AIDS prevention in America, was when a white kid, Ryan White, who's a hemophiliac, got it. Because suddenly there was someone who was a child who was blameless, who got AIDS. And then he was, of course, oppressed. He was othered. He was, we can't have him in our classrooms. We can't have him using our toilets. We don't know if we're going to get, get AIDS. Now, this is not at 1981. This is like 86, 87. This is five years into the epidemic. But the epidemic up until then was a gay thing. And now it was, oh my God, it could be a straight thing. Did you have heart surgery and need a blood transfusion? You could have AIDS. That terrified people. And suddenly people went, we have to solve AIDS. We have to figure out how to solve AIDS. And the answer was a huge overcorrection on Puritanism towards sex, sex and condoms. It's prevent, it's like, like masks today, you have to wear a mask. It was, you have to wear a condom. You always have to wear a condom, condoms, 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 condoms everywhere condoms everywhere when i went to college you couldn't you couldn't walk through a hallway without there being a, a bucket of condoms to just pick up um but that was better than before because there was nothing there was no talk about it that's how you get the silence equals death in the pink triangle so this idea of double consciousness that you don't see me as a person. You see me as a gay person. You see me as a woman, not a worker, not a colleague. That I'm a woman first is picked up later on. Feminism gives us the new woman. So we got progressivism, and in the 1920s, we have this huge break with traditional hierarchy. Well, lots of men are dead. Women went to work in the factories. Women replaced, did men's jobs for the, for the first time in large numbers. I mean, there's always been women doing men's, quote unquote, men's jobs, especially poor women doing heavy manufacturing, doing uh, retail and clothing, stitching and, and things like that. Um, even running offices, being managers. But the First World War sucked so many men out of the workplace that had to be replaced by women. And... Um, gave them levels of responsibility and income. That for the first time, women now have an, had an independence of men that they didn't have before. They also were going to receive, if their husbands, if they were widowed from the First World War, money. The first welfare was to help women take care of children who were widowed. And orphaned. 
the idea being that was the sacrifice the men were, were doing. The men were willing to go into the army because they had been promised that their wives would be, their children would be taken care of. And the government said, we will do that. And so what this allowed in the 1920s was this break. Suddenly women gain an independence they had never had before. Except it really only applies to privileged, rich, and educated women. The few who had the money to be independent of male society. Who had the money to tell men what to do. And so the biggest thing is the right to vote. A full citizenship. Equality in the law. And a right to one's body. And the right to vote is the, is the pinnacle of all of this. And the most important. Because it, it made sure the government didn't renege on its promises. By giving women the right to vote. It said... There will be a group because really, let's twenty million men are dead, right? From the First World War, so that's a lot of welfare we're going to have to pay out that we didn't have to pay before. That we're going to have to give the women and children. There's not a lot of money after the war to go around, so what's to stop a government from just saying, "F it, we just won't pay. We'll renege on our promise." The men are dead, so who cares? And so part, one of the reasons why women in the West, Britain and America, get the right to vote is to protect those, they're now a vested interest in the welfare state. And since you need their votes to win, you're going to protect the welfare to widows and orphans. You're going to protect those promises rather than get rid of them, rather than have austerity and get rid of them. So what this independence, what this money allows is new behaviors, liberal behaviors, progressive behaviors, drinking and sex, birth control, even though birth control starts as a way to limit women who have already had children. That was Margaret Sanger's, always Margaret Sanger's argument. Even Margaret Sanger slut-shamed women. But her argument was that more children made, made families poorer. That after a certain number, you should be able to stop. And so that's going to be the argument for birth control in the 1960s, the birth control pill. But what happens is single women use it, take it. And so it allows women to enjoy and have sex without the complications of marriage without the threat of getting pregnant. So we see this in Hemingway's Sun Also Rises. We see this in Fitzgerald's The Great Gatsby, where women who have sex devastate the men around them. Women who are in control of their sexuality obliterate the men around them because the men around them accept it, but they don't like it. They're like, yes, you should be able to do what you want with your body, but I just wish you would do it with me. And not other guys. I wish you picked me and not them. Now, in Great Gatsby, the main female protagonist is married. She's in a marriage. Gatsby doesn't care. Gatsby is dreaming of taking her away. So even the vow of marriage is not um, sacrosanct. And at the parties that Gatsby throws, there's sex and there's drugs. And there's drinking. The flapper becomes this idea of this female party woman. The idea that she drinks as hard as men, she parties twice as hard. She smokes, she drinks, she does drugs. This is the, the image that we get from Hemingway, especially, of Zelda Fitzgerald. The, this woman who is so much energy so much uncontained, uncontrolled freedom that it ruins the men around him, around her. That Zelda Fisher, Hemingway's attack on Zelda is that she never allowed Fitzgerald to write because Fitzgerald was always worried that she was off drinking and having affairs, that she was sleeping around. 
And so that meant he had to go to the parties to make sure she wouldn't sleep around, which made him have to drink, which means he couldn't write that day and he couldn't write the next day. And so Hemingway blamed Zelda and her liberalness for ruining the greatness that was Fitzgerald. Now we've seen in modern feminism, third wave, but especially now into the fourth wave, this reclamation of Zelda, that Zelda, even if that many of these stories aren't true, but even if they are true, here's a woman who's acting on her own, who's in control of her life. And if Fitzgerald can't handle it, that's Fitzgerald's problem. And maybe if Fitzgerald could have handled it, she wouldn't have to act out so much and things like that. It's like, it's not a woman's fault what happens to the man because the man has issues. That's a more modern reclamation. And you see this, um, um, there's, a, there's, um, there's a TV show called Zelda on Amazon Prime, I think at the moment, with Christina Ritchie as Zelda, which it comes out of, is an, an amalgam of at least two biographies of Zelda. Um, and it's trying to reclaim her as, as kind of this lost, she could have been great. She could have been a great writer if she wasn't a woman. Like she had the stuff. The problem was, is her gender trapped her even in the 1920s into her gender, her culture. She was Southern trapped her in a, in a world that stunted her abilities. So I don't know if it's true for Zelda, but it's definitely true for some women. It's definitely true in the 1920s. Not for every woman, of course. Again, we're talking about rich, privileged, educated women. So we're talking about a few women. And then we're talking about a subset of that. These women like the welfare state because it protected women with income for widows. They like socialism because it protected women from traditional patriarchy. Socialism says all people are equal. And so it says women don't have to be protected, which means, you know, kept away, hidden by the patriarchy. They can have independence. They can get jobs. They can get educations. Notes, some things to notice. The 19th Amendment, which is the right to vote for women, was the accumulation of progressive reforms from 1890 to 1915. This is, that's a progressive era. Even though the 19th Amendment is 1919, this is the, the, the culmination. This is the biggest, the most important. Um, we kind of start with universal public education uh, for elementary school and then high school. It's really for elementary school. We don't quite, we're starting to get into high school, but definitely elementary school is is where we start. Get children out of factories. We'll put them in the school. We'll teach them to lead, read, write, and do arithmetic. And the end, the kind of big last progressive thing is women's right to vote. But conservatism, especially in America, meant not all women could vote. In France, Women couldn't vote to the 40s. In Switzerland, they can't vote to the 70s, the 1970s. But in America, it meant not all women could vote. Black women couldn't vote because of Jim Crow laws in the South that, that forbid black people from voting or made it so complicated that it was impossible to vote. Asian women were not citizens. Immigration laws specifically said Asian women people, Asian immigrants were not citizens, could not get citizenship. So Asian women couldn't vote. Native women were on reservations. They were not considered American. Those reservations are little countries with their own laws scattered throughout America. So unless they put a polling station at the reservation, they couldn't participate. And guess what? They didn't. So Native women had no access. And the, the reservations were not considered America. And then poor white women couldn't vote. They could, but they had no access to the polls. 
They had no way of getting to the polls, especially in rural places. And they didn't have the education to make the decisions. They might have a third or fourth grade education. Take a look at the um, poor female character in To Kill a Mockingbird. She doesn't have... She might have a third grade education. Maybe. So... She doesn't have the ability to make decisions on who should be president, who should be mayor, who should be attorney general. So what is she going to do? She's going to, if, if she can vote, she's going to vote either by guess or she's going to do what her husband slash brother slash father tells her to. So she doesn't really have the ability to exercise her right. The right exists, but she can't really use it. So for most women, the 19th Amendment doesn't really matter because they can't access it. So they have a right they can't use. That brings us to technology. The liberalism, technology, it's kind of like the 1990s and especially the 2000s. Technology allowed for a liberalism to take hold. And this is why in modern America, it's the conservatives that have huge problems with quote unquote big tech. Well, this was true in the 1920s because technology allowed for a personal culture. Photography allowed for personal histories. You could take pictures and of time. That time you went to Paris. That time you went to Egypt. That time you had a birthday party. That time you were with your grandfather and he's now dead. Well, here's a picture that you have of him. It's frozen. That one hundredth of a second is frozen forever in time. Typewriters allowed you to make your own stories. Quickly, much quicker than handwriting. You can make your own stories and then you could distribute them. Sewing machines allowed for personal fashion. You can make your own clothes. Now we look at making your own clothes as kind of um, what poor people do. And poor people always made their own clothes. But the sewing machine allowed you to do fashion instead of hand doing it. Now you could do fashion and you could sell that fashion. You could distribute that fashion. You could just wear that fashion and show off your awesomeness. So more people were allowed to create more art. This is the, the argument of the internet, right? More people can do more culture. They could share more. It democratized language and ideas and stories and things became obtainable. All this stuff became obtainable. My great aunt who didn't spend money on anything, had an old brownie camera like the ones you see, had cameras. I inherited, I have my grandfather's war camera that he used to take pictures. So, of family and of friends, and I, I, in some cases I have the old photographs, I have the negatives. So I've got pictures from the 1920s that's, that, that exist. These people, all of whom are dead and have been dead a decade or two or more. There they are. We see this in Hemingway's Sun Also Rises where he, where he talks about this. Either you paid by learning about them, meaning things in the world, or by experience, or by taking chances, or by money. Enjoying living was learning to get your money's worth and knowing when you had it. You could get your money's worth. The world was a good place to buy in. Now, the character who's saying that is not a rich character. The character who's saying that is a journalist who's been wounded in the First World War. It's essentially Hemingway. But it's Hemingway before he becomes Hemingway. And it's all of this stuff was accessible now that industrialization had brought down the prices so that you could do things. You could go on a steamship and you could go to Paris and you didn't have to be the wealthiest of the wealthy. You could still go. I've been all around the world. You can be too. You could see many things, take many photos, write many stories, distribute those stories. That all starts in the 1920s. 
the world was a good place to buy in. You can get an excellent steak prepared by an excellent chef. You can get your money's worth. In Chicago, I had a tasting menu. It was the best meal I have ever had. It was 10 courses. I had to stop in the middle and have, have a mid partif. I had to be like, I can't, I, we have to slow down. I just, just bring me a drink. And they're like, well, what would you like? I'm like, whatever the bartender thinks would go well in the middle of a meal. And so they brought kind of a limoncello, a little lemon, and it was excellent. And the food was amazing. It was $300. It was expensive. Not everyone can do it and you can't do it all the time. I've only done it once, but it was getting your money's worth. And more importantly, knowing when you've had it, knowing in the middle, in the middle, I was eating the stuff going, this stuff is amazing. It's being in Paris saying I am in Paris. It's enjoying the moment when you're in the moment. I mean, there's Disney World. It's a good, Disney World has always been expensive. Disneyland has always been expensive. But the idea of that is, but you get your money's worth. They will give you so much stuff that no matter what you want to do, there have been times I've gone to Disney World and never gone in the parks. I just hung out in the hotels. Took the monorail around. Right? Walked, okay, I walked the, walked the, the World Showcase but didn't go on any of the rides, right? Go to the restaurants and enjoyed every minute of it. I didn't have to go on the roller coasters. That starts in the 1920s. That things were democratized so that more people could have a car. Rich people could have a nicer car, maybe a better car, a more handcrafted car. But now regular folk could have a car too. Regular folk could have a typewriter. Regular folk could have a camera. Like in the 1880s, rich people, the cameras were huge. 8 by 10 giant things, 11 by 14. You couldn't, regular people could not have a, have a camera. Now they could. So that's liberalism on the move. All of this change. And this change is brought on by the war, by changing in women, by changing in black culture and black mobility and changing in technology that allowed more people to participate in the cultural life of the world. Thank you.